Hey, John here. So, uh, digging through some old magazines in the old basement shelves, I came across March 1983 issue of Bite Magazine here. And I remember this magazine. I actually remember it. I read it to death because of the taped-on back cover here that's all ripped up and half off. Why? Because there's an article in here that was the first time... Here, let me prop this up a little bit here. There we go. I uh, got into some stuff by this guy, Steve Ciarcia. I think that's how he pronounces his name. He, I've seen it written phonetically. He puts the emphasis on the first I-A. Any of you out there know the guy? Let me know. Uh, Bob, if you're watching, I know you worked with him. Is that, am I saying it right? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. Anyhow, um, he used to write a column in Byte Magazine called Circuit Seller. And you might know that name by the magazine from, you know, about, I don't know, seven, eight years after this. Uh, and even not that long. This is 83. Uh, Circuit Seller is the name of a magazine that, that Steve started publishing on his own in the later 80s. I don't know, 70 or 78, 88 or 89, somewhere in there. He started publishing his own uh, whole magazine focused just on the articles of the style that he used to write uh, for Bike Be Be Magazine at the time. Anyway, he wrote an article here uh, about this TI single uh, chip modem. 300 baud modem on a single chip. And I read this article and I was drooling all over because these prices are true. I don't know. I kind of zoom in on the camera here. I don't know. It says in here, it, it comments that, you know, 300 baud modems are generally under 200 bucks at the time of the writing here. And the mostly 1200 baud units, which is about as fast as we could go back then, are in the 700 to a thousand dollar range. And that was, you know, 1983 dollars probably double that for today's dollars. So, you know, I'm not going to spend $2,000 on a modem, uh, especially when I'm a student in college. And by the way, if you went to college back then, you'd know that almost all the dial-up modem pools, if you even had one at your university, ran at 300 baud anyway. Or let me rephrase that. All the modem pools that you were allowed to use as a student ran at 300 baud. So this is as fast as this was the speed limit anyway. He writes this article, single board modem like this. Oh, I was so excited. I just had to absolutely have one. I glued to reading this article over and over and over again. And at the end over here, you can buy the ECM 103 modem kit. Comes complete with all the parts and yada, yada, yada. 60 bucks. Now, optionally, you could either buy the acoustic coupler kit, which you see pictured here with a phone stick on there like that, which is a little speaker and a microphone with the little rubber hoses to hook your phone up. Or you could buy the, well, this may not be approved for use on all telephone systems, direct connect transformer for $9, which uh, <clears throat> I promptly bought without any regard to whether or not I could use it on my college campus phone system. Hint, it works perfectly. It worked then and it works today as we will soon see. So here's what became of mine. Uh, so I immediately ran out and bought a kit, you know, for 66 bucks or whatever. It was a bargain of a lifetime. Uh, what do we got here? It looks like a power transformer here. It says 12 volt, zero 12. So this is a 24 volt center tap transformer. I don't know if you can see that in there. Uh, I'm sure this is from Radio Shack. <laughs> it says Archer right there. Definitely from Radio Shack, right? Uh, there you go. You can see it. Um, what do we got here? <laughs> a 273 number. That's the Radio Shack order number for this transformer. So they had that manufactured for them themselves, I'm sure. Nice lamp cord to power it here. The two mounting bolts, if I recall correctly, the PC board is about this big, so there wouldn't be room for this inside. I just bolted it on the back. This is, uh, if I recall correctly, this is just a Y connector. It has a single modular jack that brings it out into two, so you could put two phones into one connector kind of thing. And that's because uh, modems in this era, this was not going to auto-dial. It's not going to auto-answer or anything else. So what you would do is you'd plug one line into the wall and another one into your phone, and you'd have to manually use your phone to dial and, you know, or even, you know, pick up sometimes uh, when somebody would call you 
if you didn't know it, it was a modem uh, and you'd just pick up and you'd talk to the guy, hey, I want you to connect up your modem and stuff. And, and they'd say, OK, fine. And then click the switch and you'd be on. So this is a very manual control. All right. So, yeah, that was to hook up the phone line and a uh, regular POTS phone handset. And yes, yeah, so these switches here, this would be probably a power button or it is a uh, switch that will turn on the modem to uh, connect it to the phone. I don't know if this is just powered on all the time and we connect to the phone and disconnect or if this thing is um, turns on and off the power. I'm not sure. Now that I think about it, I suspect this thing just picks up the phone and, and hangs up the phone. I'll bet anything that's what it is. So let's have a look inside here. Well, obviously, there's the DB25, which is what we all use for serial ports until the IBM came along and said these are too big. And since we only use three wires most of the time anyway, and replaced it with the DB9, which is probably a much better way to go in retrospect, right? So let's take these off. This, of course, would have been your standard Radio Shack metal box. Always good to smack the microphone with the screwdriver. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you're wearing headphones. Ooh. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, this is not something I'm going to just open up with all these little phone wires in there. I guess you can sort of see that. Yeah, if you do too much with this, all the wires are going to pop off. Oh, man, yeah. Hey, I was a kid. <laughs> College kid, but a kid nonetheless. Oh, look at that. A piece of cereal box or something over here for my insulator for this bolt on there. I love it. I love it. So it looks like the power comes in there. There's a the little transformer for the uh, for the phone line connection. Oh boy. Uh yeah, wow. There's a um bridge rectifier dial to four four wires coming out of here. Looks like the AC voltage comes in and connects directly up to the transformer. So the the toggle switch, yeah, the toggle switch on this side with the red uh the red front down that you saw earlier. This switch here looks like these wires go through and connect to the phone jack over here. So when it's plugged in, it's on. I love it. No heat sinks. Probably doesn't use any real current anyway, but there's three regulators I can see in here. So that's going to be your 5, 12, and minus 12 volt regulators. Some capacitors taped onto the bottom of the box there. Oh, this is <laughs> this is beautiful vintage. Wow. And then the circuit board there. Uh, I, that, I'm not going to play with this. Uh, so I'm going to just break off all the wires <laughs> if we play with it too much. That's a riot. There's the yesteryear for you. I got a little better at uh, being neat about these things. If I made something like this today, and I used literally smashed it in the same box and stuff, I would have probably put strain reliefs and used stranded wire instead of solid core. Because uh, while I love solid core and still use it for all kinds of stuff today, you really want to use stranded if you're going to build something like this. Of course, if you ever expect to open it. This thing hasn't been opened probably in 35 years since I built it. And the reason you want to use stranded instead of solid core, if you've got to have some sort of movement, like, you know, that's why these cords here don't have solid core, is because the solid core will uh, crack and snap off, okay? So what you would, if I made this right and I had my brains, and maybe I just didn't have any, you know, you're in a hurry, you're a kid, every, every quarter back in those days uh, counted. So uh, I might not have had uh, stranded. Uh, uh, and then of course, tie it down. So you don't put strain on the various solder joints and things on the backs of these switches or something. And then if you open up the box, the stranded part can move around and not break off. So hopefully we didn't do any real damage to this thing. Now, uh, how do we run? How do I demonstrate this in this day and age? Right. <laughs> if there even was a modem pool to di dial into, I wouldn't know. There, might, there probably are somewhere. I'll bet like the weather service or somebody still has one. Uh, not that I would know. And uh, problem number two, a truck uh, about a year or two ago drove down the street and tore all the phone lines off my house. I used to have like 10, no, actually 12 lines in here. I had a modem pool and all the other stuff in the 90s and ran a dial-up BBS and all that other fun stuff. Uh, and uh, all that phone equipment and everything, uh, 
<laughs> got disconnected one day when the truck tore all the wiring off the side of my house with uh, you know a poorly mounted ladder rack or something. I don't know. Ripped all the wiring and everything out. And it was at that point I decided, well, you know, I hadn't had the modem pool running since the 90s anyway. And the only thing left in that whole setup was a single dial-up uh, landline that I never used anyhow. So I just canceled the service. And there it sits, unused, <laughs> big empty box on the side of the house. Which brings us to, how do I test this? Okay, well, I'm going to test this by simply just connecting it up to another modem, and I'm going to use a uh, intercom style POTS phone network that we can just wire up with a power supply and some resistors. Okay, so here we have the uh, 300 baud direct connect uh, modem all plugged in here. This connector here is a DB25 adapter for this terminal here, a regular old dumb terminal. This is actually a DEC VT320. Thanks again, Bob. It's twice I've, 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 I've shot out to Bob here on my channel. He sent this over uh, so I can use it for times like this when I need a genuine bona fide dumb terminal. And a VT320 is kind of like the Cadillac of the DEC terminal uh, era there. Anyway, um, this is a really nice terminal is my point. Uh, and a 300 baud modem uh, wired in here to a uh, you know, 12 volt intercom uh, line that I can use then to uh, power the uh, simulate the phone company between this modem and another modem. In this case, it'll be a Courier V dot everything modem complete with X2 56 KB technology Whoa, whoa, whoa. now this at the time you know in the 90s this was the cat's meow this is probably the end of the line of analog uh dial-up style modem technology here the the 56 kb is as fast as you can go on a voice line and it turns out as i understand it you in order to get 56 kb to work on one end, you need to have actually a digital interface on the other end. Uh, that's subject to a whole nother conversation. Uh, but yeah, this is really pushing the, um, the limits of most phone uh, systems in order to get that much bandwidth on a regular voice line. You'd need to have a, a dual pair like I used to have back in the day with dedicated 56 KB uh, modems on there with a, uh, a, you know, CSU, DSU, and all the other fun stuff. Somewhere in the basement, I got all that stuff lying around somewhere, too. Anyway, uh, this is what we're going to talk to uh, from our um, 300 baud modem. And as I sit here looking at it just now, what we're looking at, I mean, by 300 baud modem standards, this is the, probably the top of the line uh, because it does not have an acoustic coupler. So this is the top of the line, oldest old school modem you could probably have, even including homemade and everything. And go at talking to the top of the line, uh, end of the line, uh, most modern analog modem over here. So in two generations. The only thing worse than this would be a genuine uh, acoustic coupler, which I don't have. And right now I regret not having one to show you. It would be fun to play with that. Anyway, uh, with an acoustic coupler, you would need to have something like this to simulate a, an actual telco so that you could then bring in your phone, which is why these modems were shaped this way. This slab design, this is the only way a modem should have ever been built. This was dumb of me to do this because there's nowhere to put the freaking phone and it was dumb of all the companies that made tower modems to waste more desk space than you should because you're supposed to put the phone on top of the modem like this okay um anyway what did i know when i was a kid anyhow so uh well how does all this stuff plug in here uh, I'll leave the phone over here. Actually, for this demo, I don't think I really need it because this modem, I think, has a mode. We can put this modem in a mode where we can turn a speaker on that's inside this modem and listen to it while it's connected and, and communicating. And that's the main reason I had the uh, phone sitting on my desk at the moment anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this into a USB adapter on my PC like that. And plug in the power. It's got a little wall wart that it comes with. Okay. 
We got a phone line cable here, and on the bottom they give you a little picture. Put the phone in this jack over here, and then put the line in that one here. So we'll put the line where it's supposed to go. And the reason it makes a difference on a modem like this, unlike mine, this one has a relay in it that will disconnect the handset when the modem is talking, uh, exchanging data. Mine doesn't do that. Mine just has two things. You, you want to disconnect the handset? Hang it up. <laughs> That's how you disconnect mine. All right, so I got 12 volts DC on here. These two are wired literally in series with each other, and the voltage comes in with 360 ohm series uh, resistance on that. I took about that in another video. I'll link to below in the description of this video if you want to know more about what I'm doing with this thing. Okay, so now we're all wired up. And if I turn on my courier HST, that's not an HST. This is a V everything. The HST was a prior model, I believe, from this one. And it looks exactly like it. So I'm going to probably call it wrong every time I do this. Okay, so what we have now are two modems, a simulated telephone system that doesn't have any uh, ringing or dialing or anything going on, but it's fine. We can flip this switch up. The red one on here will cause this to go off hook, pick up the phone, in other words. Uh, simulate that. Uh, this one will auto answer if there was ring voltage going into it. If this one could dial and, and you know, my simulated phone did all that, this would automatically answer and so on. So this is plugged in and turned on. You can see the LEDs here are lit up to let me know that the USB connector, the serial port here on my PC is working okay. So let's go to the desktop and see how that works. Okay, so the way this works is you can type an attention command in there. There we go. And you can see how slow this is going. We're running at 300 baud, 8 none 1 in this configuration, okay? It's because on the other end, the uh, my old modem, that's all it will ever do. So what I want to do is I want to call the other modem from my courier modem here. And the way that happens is when you put it on a regular phone, you would say AT for attention. Then you say dial T for touch tone. And you could say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if that was the phone number that you'd want to call. Now, if this was plugged into a real phone line, what would happen is it would go off hook. You would hear a dial tone. Then the modem would dial these these uh, these digits here, and you would hear the whole thing because the modem has a little speaker on it, so you can hear the the uh, call starting, and that's a famous sound you still hear to this day. And everybody goes, "Oh, I remember the old modem sounds." So here is what this modem will do. Now, if you hit enter at this point, it'll just abort because it didn't get any carrier uh, because there's nothing that picked up the phone on the other end, all right? So let's go ahead and do that again. 9876543. Now, if I use the uh, reach over to the other modem and I take it off hook, you can hear the high pitch tone that was being emitted by my 300 baud modem that the courier then recognized immediately as old school 300 baud. And at this point, it says, I recognize that. It prints out that it's connected and it's now speaking to the other modem at 300 baud. So if I had a bunch of keys, at this time, you'll see them show up on the VT320. If I type on the VT320, you'll see them show up in here on my terminal. Now, uh, to get the real feel for 300 baud, what we can do is we can just send uh, text 
to the other side here. With this running at 300 baud, I can just cut and paste regular old text from my desktop into this terminal, and we'll see it show up on the um, on the uh, uh, on the VT320 over there. Now, one of the problems in doing that, though, is every time you hit Enter, you know, the carriage return, what that really means is on the VT320, you know, the terminal on the other end, move the cursor back over to the far left of the screen. It does not go down a line. That is Control-J. Okay, so what I did uh, by hitting enter here and then control J is on my VT320, I just moved the cursor to the left and then I moved it down a line. My point is that if I want to paste a bunch of text in here and see it scroll up on the VT320, I can't just do that without doing something special. The problem with just pasting a bunch of text in here is going to be that the way the the data works is that if you get a carriage return, if I say like, for example, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, and then we look over at the VT320, we see what I just typed. If I now press the Enter key, we can see that the cursor just goes to the far left of the current line on the screen. Okay, so now if I type, like, say, a bunch of I's, a little bunch of lowercase I's, and then I hit Enter, you can see that overwrote the line underneath it. If I hit a bunch of O's, and I hit Enter, again, it overrides it over and over again. So if I just paste a bunch of text in there, it's going to draw over the top of itself over and over and over again. Now, this goes back to the original reason, probably, why CPM and then Microsoft, and Microsoft stays to this very day, um, leaving the carriage return line feed separate bytes in their text files together to this very day. Let's take a quick uh, look at something here. So let's say I added a file, by ABC, and I type in line one, and I get line, oops, two, line three, line four, or whatever I want to do here. And I want to look at that file in hex. Oops, helps if you name the file. <laughs> All right, what do we got? L I N E space is the two zero, a thirty one is a one, and we see O A. That's a carriage return. Then we see L I N E, sixty five is an E, space is twenty, a thirty two is a two, carriage return, and so on. All right, that's what the data is in this file. That's what it's on the screen. If I cat A B C like so, and I paste this into my terminal, you're going to see it on the 320. It's going to go over and write over itself as it goes. Now, if I don't want it to do that, I can actually run it through Unix to DOS, ABC, I think it'll do it, yeah. If I hex dump it again, I don't use this command very often, oops. <laughs> I forgot again to do that. Notice this is L-I-N-E space one. Now it says O-D-O-A. So that's both the carriage return and the line feed, <laughs> which reminds me, I misspoke earlier. Uh, Unix doesn't use a carriage return at all. It only uses a line feed. The OA is only a line feed, not a carriage return. And that's actually why if you took this original file and you opened it up on uh, um, DOS, or a CPM machine, what it would do is it would go across the screen like this, it would go down a line here, and then it would go across like this and down a line, and it would stair step. That's why it does that. This one here will print out the L-I-N-E-1, then it'll go back over to the left, because O-D is what it sends when I press the enter key. Then it'll go O-A, which is a control J, and it'll go down to a new line, and it'll print these one after another vertically. Now, in order to do that, I don't think I can just cat ABC like, in fact, I can't. If I copy and paste this, it'll still write over itself like it did last time. But if I go in here and I say send and receive files, uh, send files, where's send files? There's receive. There might be an S in here somewhere, probably. Send files, S, yeah, okay. Now I can choose how I want to do it. These are all, you know, 
handshaking and stuff like that. It sends the data over, and then the other side will come back and ask, oh, did you get it okay? If not, I'll resend it. And so these are really useful for the five-hour-long downloads, which is what you have at 300 baud. So it's very rare you would just send raw ASCII, which is what I'm going to do right now, to the other side. Now we can pick various files. Uh, what I got to do is go into my home directory. I can then type in ABC like that, and it will send the data down there in raw ASCII, including all the character turns and line feeds. You can see they all come up on their own lines the way they're supposed to now, okay? So let's go ahead and find a nice file here. Now, whenever you need a whole bunch of text, just go get some lorem ipsum, okay? Which is just a uh, bunch of words that are pseudo Latin sounding words. Well, what do you do? Somewhere in here it says generate uh, five paragraphs of text. Okay, thank you. And there you have it. So you can just take your mouse now and grab it all. Come on. Yeah. What you use this for normally, if you've never heard of this. This is normally what uh, people that are, you know, I'm going to build a website or create a web page or something like that. And I want to create a, put a bunch of text in a page and fill it up like it would look later if there were actually, you know, actual text in there. So this is just filler. And it's uh, not going to be accidentally filled with anything that's allegedly offensive or anything. So I'm going to call this, uh, put it in a file called lorem. I'm going to paste it in there. And then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to say wrap man wrap uh, man fold <laughs> is the name of the command boy reaching back of the oldies here so what happens is you can use this command called uh, fold on unix based system and said wherever a space breaks a word add a carriage return so that it's not just one long line per paragraph which is what it looks like i got from the uh, lorem ipsum thing and you can say how many Characters wide, and I think it defaults to 80. Yeah, so if you say fold minus s lorem, uh, what it'll do, uh, filled, if you type it in right, it'll line wrap them. If I just cat lorem, you can see it's all just uh, chopped up and wrapping around in my screen. So what I want to do now is fold it, save it in a file called X, and then say Unix to DOS X. Now I can send X to the other end, and we can see what 300 baud really looks like. And this is what doing your homework was like in 1983. You got really good at remembering what your code looked like in your mind. So you didn't have to, you know, list it on the screen all the time. The whole idea of WYSIWYG back then was a joke because you did not want to wait for your screen to draw. All right. I am sure some people did because they didn't know any better. Uh, now you know why people had those paper terminals and stuff like that. You know, when it's on paper, you can look back and, and see what's on there. And uh, you don't have to keep listing it up, or, you know, you don't have to scroll back. You can literally physically do it when it's on paper. Now, if we plug a phone in on the uh, dumb modem that, remember, does not ever disconnect the phone when the data uh, call is being made, we can listen in on the tones while the data is being transmitted. It turns out that the courier modem also has a way to leave the speaker on while the call's going on. Now, uh, if you go back here and we look, I've got the manual for it here, which is still online from usrobotics.com, usr.com. Uh, somewhere in here, speaker, we should be able to find. Always off, always on until the call's negotiated. This is the normal state of the modem, which is why it's highlighted, it's the default. M2 means the speaker is always on. So if I want to, I can set it to M2, and I can say AT, okay, AT, M2. Okay, now, what happens is, when I make a call, I'll be able to hear it the whole time. 
So we say A T D T, you know, whatever, five, six, seven, eight. Oops, I misdialed. <laughs> I mistyped. A T D T five six seven eight. All right. Yeah, that's not going to get annoying. <laughs> we won't leave it on for long. <laughs> so if we send the file again, alarm, uh, and Hollywood would be proud. Of course, this is 300 baud. Not exactly your 56 KB. Boy, that's a headache generator if I ever heard one. Anyway, so there you have it. That's 300 baud. Uh, my 37 year old, 38, oh my God, 39 year old modem at this point. Uh, my good old college modem. Still working like it was brand new, even though it has the most creative wiring of anything I've shown on my channel in here. <laughs> nasty snap off wires all over inside there still working like it's brand new <laughs> thanks for watching i'll see you next time <laughs>